started training when I was 16, but from then there was just something that stuck with me. What's your what's your heaviest what's your heaviest pull? Off the floor, mm -hmm. three. Uh, I'm gonna say a 327 double. Had it on on the TV and we watched it, and then from there I was like, I think I was just so mesmerised at these monsters. Ultimately, the dream was getting made into reality because. I was training every single week. And I think because of that, I was like, I was putting the most effort in. How did your wrestling days come to an end? I was, um, I was quite gutted. The bodybuilding's taken off. I'm doing considerably well in bodybuilding. For anyone listening or watching who doesn't know the difference between a professional bodybuilder to yep. a hobbyist, someone who just goes to the gym. Yep. What is the actual difference? Like, with pressure, is there money? Do you have to stay at a level of leanness all year? Yeah. You can't take something to become more mature. You can only allow for time of training, dieting, getting bigger. But I know for a fact, people are gonna look at you and go, there's no way he's natty, because you're a monster, mate. What do you say to those type of people who, who think that? So today, we are joined by Kiffy West. Now, for those who don't know, he's the biggest, <laughs> I, can't, I can't say the swear word that I want to say, but he's the biggest <clears throat> bloke in Ultraflex. By a mile. By a country mile. I would probably even go as far as five miles. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, mate. So mm. I don't want to ask you the boring question straight away of like, where did it all begin? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't ask me that. <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what it is, mate. I'm going to switch it up. I'm going to switch it up. Okay. How did you get to the size that you are? What do you want me to like list all the drugs? I just mean, well, I just mean with you being. <laughs> no, I'm joking. At least nobody take that serious. I'm just, I'm not. Yeah, I'm just Sometimes being. Sometimes I can't help myself. I, I just mean with you being like five miles. Um, okay, so know. for the first three miles, um, I really had to work on that one. Um, it was a case of training six times a day, um, eating two meals a day. And yeah, like I, I just kind of started. Going in and training full body, every single, every single, <laughs> that's a bad start, that's such a bad start. <laughs> right, I'm going to be serious now, I'll be serious. Okay, let's go. So, what did you ask again? How did hmm. you get to the size that you, how old are you by the way? 25. You're 25 year old. Coming 26. Now, being honest, being in and around the gym industry and fitness industry in general for years, I don't, you don't normally see people you know, a 25 year old as big as what you are naturally as well and lifting the type of tin that you're lifting. How do you get to that position? I, I've i pretty much isolated myself since I was 16 against absolutely everything. So like I've never really had your typical younger generation social life. I don't go out. I, I've, I've never drank. Like I don't drink. Um, and since I, this is, Funnily enough, we're actually moving into my 10th year of training in March. And since then, it's just been a case of, I've not been a bodybuilder since I was 16. Mm -hmm. I started training when I was 16, but from then there was just something that stuck with me. That it was a case of, this was for me. I struggled growing up to really stick to anything. Like I would do something for maybe a month, two months, and I would be like, you know, this is boring, this is not for me. Mm -hmm. But something stuck when I started training and I was just like, I know you, you really often hear it of people saying like, yeah, I just lifted a weight and then I was hooked. Mm -hmm. Or I seen results and then I was hooked. But just being in a weights environment, I don't even want to say a gym environment because for the first eight years of my training, I was based out of a leisure centre mm -hmm. and like a little private studio as well where I was myself. But it was just the weights, it was the, the just being able to go in and pick something heavy up and get that feeling of maybe even doing something that I've never done before. Mm -hmm. Do you know, it's a continued line of progression, especially at that age, especially at that time within your, your training career. You're always doing something more. Yeah. And from then, it was just like, this was it. It was, it quickly became part of my life and it quickly became that, a daily need of mine was that or that had to be satisfied was just going to the gym whether that be for an hour two hours 30 minutes could be anything at all but mm -hmm. i was still at school so i was training all over the place but as long as i got to the gym i was fine 
So you did that to kind of make you happy more than anything else, yeah. really, didn't you? Did you notice you were, you were strong anyway, though, before the age of 16? Mm, not really, because I kind of went through that many different sports and mm-hmm. trying them and not really taking them that far. That it, None of them ever really included any sort of strength-based activities. Right, okay. So you never Ma- really got the chance to actually explore your strength? Nah, and then at school they got a gym, and any time that we were in, like, PE and we had scheduled to go to the gym and we got to go to the gym. I was always the most looking forward to that. So like mm-hmm. at that time, I think I was only 15. I had to wait until I was 16 to get into the leisure center. But when I got in there and got into the gym at the school, I was like always trying to just full send things, always trying to lift my heaviest. Mm-hmm. Um, And I definitely noticed that I was probably one of the strongest in the class. Like I, I kind of was able to do things that not really anybody in my kind of age category in class was able to do, which was, nice but the second that i turned 16 i was like right i, I, I want to go to the main gym and mm-hmm. the main gym at the time back in stranor was the leisure center so right i see i got into that and it's just kind of spiraled from there and what, now what was your environment there. though kif like when you were growing up in that area of scotland like was it is it like was it like council was it were you from a nice area yeah like i was from a little village called les Walt, and it was a nice little area um it is a nice little area, but mm-hmm. there's nothing there. There's, there, I wasn't, I wasn't brought up with an environment around me pushing me to do this, pushing me to do that. Mm-hmm. Apart from my mum, so it was just me and my mum that lived at home, mm-hmm. and no siblings. Nope. No. And she was always the one that was putting that emphasis on me going and trying new things. Mm-hmm. So if I went and tried something, never stuck to it, it'll be okay. We'll try this. We'll try this. We'll try this, and then she pushed me into eventually going into the main gym. Mm-hmm. At, this, at that time, I wasn't driving or anything like that, so I was. I never really had that kind of main independence that I could just go and do what I wanted. Yeah. But it was like when she could take me into the gym, or I could get a lift into the gym, or I could get the bus to the gym, or I could walk to the gym. It was. I always had that support from her that was right. We'll go and do this, and we'll go and do this. Um. But yeah, back in in Le Swalt, back in Stranraer, like it's a really small town. Mm-hmm. Um, like anywhere, there's your good bits and there's your bad bits, but there's nothing there. Right, there's, so um, no prospects as a young lad. Nah, you, I was able to push it as far as I could. Don't get me wrong, I turned pro out of the leisure center, but that was from making it work. Yeah, exactly. That's it. That's in. I think that's more in you than anything else, yeah. isn't it? What did your mum do? Um, she was um so. In her earlier years, she worked in security, and then now she is a cleaner at primary schools. Right, I see. So I see. the reason I ask that, mate, is because for someone to have a mother who just, you know, unconditionally believes in the son yeah. to go and do what they want. Yeah. You know, a few things would spring to my mind. Is it the lack of father in your life? Is yeah. it the fact that we just yeah. want our son to do whatever he wants and be yeah. happy? Or is it a desperation, like we want you to succeed? Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? What do you think yeah. that was? Well, I mean, I, I never, um, like growing up, I, I never really had that male role model. I mm-hmm. had my grandpa, which we were really close with, um, and we are still really close with. He was that male role model, but to be fair, like for 95% of the time, it's just been my mum. Mm-hmm. And growing up, I always wanted to be a pro wrestler. Like mm-hmm. I grew up obsessed with wrestling, like mm-hmm. WWE yeah. and I really, really, really just wanted to become a wrestler, which was actually partly why I wanted to start training, just to become stronger yeah. and kind of put more effort into that goal of becoming a wrestler that at that time was probably very unrealistic to anybody. Now, I never got on well at school, never left school with anything. Um, I was always kind of getting into trouble at school and things like that, but I was never, I was never like really bad it mm-hmm. was just, I just never enjoyed it. Yeah, I And it. because of that, I was never really bothered about the effort that went into it. Mm-hmm. And then at school, it was like, we got to that position where we were, of course, getting older and we were getting ready to leave or getting ready to start working and things like that. And we were always getting the like, what do you want to be and things like that. And my answer was always, I just wanted to become a pro wrestler. I didn't care about anything yeah. else. Like anybody that asked me, I wanted to become a pro wrestler. So I think learning at a very early age that I was so fixated on just wanting to become a pro wrestler and my mum could see that Mm -hmm. and then I was always getting the knockback of 
how unrealistic it was. So at school by teachers and maybe like people at school in my class and things like that. It was never your, I want to become a doctor. I want to become a policeman. I want to yeah. become a firefighter or, or anything like that. It was just, I want to become a pro wrestler. I think that's what's crazy about that though. Like it's, it's quite nice, mate, the fact that it's such an obscure thing to want to do yeah. when you're a kid. Like, not many kids aren't. I don't think I knew anybody who wanted to be a wrestler. I was yeah. all the usual footballer. But even that was like, I want to be a footballer. All right. Yeah. But nothing. maybe he's play for the school team and that'll yeah. be it. Yeah. With with totally, you know, wanting to be a wrestler and having your mum support, I feel like it's probably because of your mum yeah. why you wanted to pursue it that much because yeah. you, you yeah. went on to try, didn't you? Yeah. You did have a go at wrestling. Yeah, well, that was the thing as well. I had to wait until I was 16 to get into the wrestling school in Glasgow. So... Mm-hmm. At the time, again, growing up, obviously we never grew up millionaires. We never had money just to throw it becoming a wrestler. And one thing I will say is it's most definitely not the cheapest of things to learn how to become, especially being from Stranraer. We had like a three hour commute, two hour, two um, and a half hour commute there and back mm-hmm. every single week. Um, so when the school opened and I turned 16, um, you then become a, you can apply to get into the school and every single week my mum would drive me from Stranraer up around maybe halfway and then we'd get the train halfway to Glasgow train for three and a half hours every mm. single weekend and then travel back and just kind of do the same and the same and the so same I was 16 that, and at the time like obviously I was 16 I was as mature as what I was at 16 but it was like I was still so fixated on that goal. I was like, I'm becoming a pro wrestler. That's it. Like, I don't care about anything else. I was still at school. And mm-hmm. um, this was just getting made. Ultimately, the dream was getting made into reality because I was training every single week. And I think because of that, I was like, I was putting the most effort in. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was also something that I got moved up very quickly in the class because my trainers at the wrestling could see that I was putting a lot of effort in. And the first part of that effort was just like the six hour round trip every mm-hmm. single week yeah, just exactly. to try just and showing up yep um and i then got moved up class moved up class like so i was kind of at the beginner then i got moved up into intermediate and then i was moved up into advanced and then i started getting bookings for shows and then it was like right everything was becoming everything was just becoming real yeah and from that very start and position my mom was always there so it was like she was helping me get to these classes. She was helping me get to the school every week. Mm-hmm. She was helping me get to the Do shows. Do you think she recognised your talent? Or, you, or your certain, certainly your determination? I think it was just the determination of the goal. I, yeah. I, that's all I've seen. I kind of never seen anything else. I never, I never showed interest in anything else. Mm-hmm. Again, coming up, I was never going out. I was never socialising. I was never... I was just like, this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And that's it. So, what was your friendship group like? Because again, if you're the only, was it a few, a few of your friends want to do it as well, or was it just you? It was just me. Like nobody else in my friend group had an interest in wrestling. Right. Um, to be fair, not really many people, even at school, had an interest in wrestling. It was just, I think, it was one of them things where, because of where we were and how unrealistic it would be to even have an interest in potentially doing it. Some people watched it an odd time. Some people would watch the odd WrestleMania here and there, just mm-hmm. like anybody does. Um, but. My friend group was, everybody was all different. Everybody mm-hmm. had different jobs. A couple of people went to uni. Um, a couple of people are still in Stranraer. And I keep still, com- I, I still communicate with everybody that I was at school with, but they all kind of have a different lifestyle compared to what I do. I wonder what they're thinking, you know? It's, it's... I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully good things. Ah, that's, it's, it's, I rem- it's funny you mentioned because... I, I remember, I've got a fond memory of watching WWF at the yeah. time, Heat, on a Sunday. Yeah. And it was because we didn't have Sky. So a lot of my friends had Sky. We didn't have yeah. Sky. Yeah. So I had to wait four o'clock on a Sunday to go home to watch wrestling. What? what was it about wrestling for you that made you obsessed with it? I don't know. It was... was it the way the, 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 the looked? Yeah. Was I, it the strength? Was it the... I think it was just... It was definitely partly to do with the fact that when I started growing up and... It was like your Batistas in their prime, Triple H in their prime. Like they, they were just monsters. Mm-hmm. And from like a very early age, um, it was my uncle that actually introduced me to it and he kind of had it on on the TV and we watched it. And then from there I was like, I think I was just so mesmerized that 
these monsters was so agile as well yeah and yeah. it was like from there i was i was just hooked on it and it was like your john cena's in their prime mm-hmm. um and that's when i think anyway that's when i think wrestling was like it's ultimate like best i just kind of missed the attitude era of wrestling which mm-hmm. people say now was when it was very much in its prime but when i kind of grew up and who i got to see growing up i got like the the back end of that attitude era and then into your kind of little bit of modern but it was enough to have you had you met any of the wrestlers i'd met a couple of them i've, I've met a couple of them when we went to some wrestling events live like wwe events live right um, okay, i see We'd do the the crazy four or five hours lining up to mm. meet them for thirty seconds. But at the time, I was like, I was like ten, eleven, twelve, and again, like my mum was taking me to some some WWE events. My uncle took me to a WWE event, mm. and it was like you're just getting that little taste all the time. Oh yeah, it was it was it. it was just like it was it was just insane. And then when I actually got into it myself. And got a few years into it and then started getting bigger bookings for bigger shows. Mm-hmm. I was then sharing the locker room with some of the guys that I was like watching coming up who are now kind of maybe came out of WWE and are yeah. doing some independent scene wrestling. And I'm like sharing locker rooms with them thinking like really trying not to fanboy uh-huh. because I'm like, I've, I've now got a job to do. This mm-hmm. is now what I do, but it's mm-hmm. almost not real because you're then sharing locker rooms with people yeah, who yeah. you watched on TV growing up. So yeah, I I know the experience really well. With uh, I found myself in scenarios over the last, phew, the last if certainly the last five. It's been pretty much all my life, mate. But since the last five years, it's been really apparent when I've been like I've been sitting in the room with the likes of whoever it may be, K- a KSI or yeah, someone like that. Yeah. And I'm like, hell, I remember watching these guys on YouTube when I was younger, and I'm like, but. It's made it still blows my mind to this day, and uh, and and I'm always grateful that I yep. get to do the things that I do, and you must have that experience because what what was really nice there when you said you know you you'd do the lines you'd queue for hours, I've actually seen you at expos where people queue to see you as well, <laughs> and people want photos with you and all that type of stuff now as well, and I think it's unbelievable how since you've got into bodybuilding, you've You've literally went from watching wrestling, getting into bodybuilding, now people fanboy you to a degree. And, it, and it's, well, not even to a degree, they, they do it. Because, I, mate, I go to the same gym as you, and most people talk about how strong you are. I, they, but, mate, they don't talk about anybody else like that. And it's mm-hmm. always you. It's always, I've ever seen what he's pulling off the floor. It's, and that's what, that's what blows my mind. How did your wrestling days come to an end? I was... Um... I was quite gutted about it all, but it was only because I got into competitive bodybuilding and I was trying to balance them at the same time, but it got to the point where I was taking bookings for wrestling, but I was getting very lean. So I was prepping for a show and I went through a weekend where I actually had a wrestling show on a Saturday night and had a bodybuilding show on the Sunday. So a bodybuilding competition on the Sunday. So I was at my leanest Mm -hmm. and I thought it was a good idea to do the wrestling show on the Saturday night. It was actually a home show, so it was. So it was when a federation came back to Stranor and I actually got put in for a no disqualification match that night. So there was kendo sticks, steel chairs, there was everything oh happening. And at, at, the time, at the time, I was like, this is such a good idea. Because mm-hmm. um, <laughs> you look the part. It was just, it was like, I've just got to do this. So it very quickly became that that would then happen more often. It never happened kind of on the same weekend again, but it kind of started getting to the point where I was just getting closer and closer and closer to injuries, things like concussions and that. It just became a little bit maybe too too kind of risky mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to do both of them. But at the time, I couldn't really see anything else. Like for a good couple of years, when I started competing in bodybuilding and when I was still wrestling, I couldn't see anything else apart from, right, I'm going to do both of these as far as I can take them. But then Mm. I kind of realised after a couple of years of doing it that maybe one of them has to kind of take a bit of a backseat. And what actually happened was um, one of my really good friends in wrestling who I looked up to a lot and it was actually to do with him that I started the school that I went to and I went to his federation and, and watched his shows. It was because of him that I got into the school that I did and I always had the kind of goal of 
working with him, getting on a show with him mm-hmm. um, in front of like a big crowd. And he unfortunately took his own life um, around a few months after, or a few months before, sorry, I kind of called it a day with wrestling. And I felt that the time was right because I had achieved what I wanted to achieve in wrestling by that time. Mm-hmm. And it was one of them things that I just kind of thought, right, within the bodybuilding as well, the bodybuilding's taken off. I'm doing considerably well in bodybuilding. So I think the time is right now to just kind of put the wrestling to the side. Yeah, I've achieved what I want to achieve. I've took it far enough. Um, It's always going to be there. Mm-hmm. But moving on was just kind of the right feel at the time. I, I, I got that feeling that the time was right. And any time before that, I never. Mm-hmm. But when everything started happening and um, ultimately the, the feeling just came out of nowhere. Like I, I wasn't expecting it to happen, but I just kind of got to that point where I thought if I also want to take bodybuilding as far as what I do, I'm going to be getting leaner. I'm then going to have to put off things like shows for wrestling. Yeah. That's then going to have a hindrance on my potential bookings in the future. Stories on federations. So I thought, the time is right, put it to the side and just put everything into bodybuilding that I can. Mm-hmm. And from there, a couple of years later after that, then I turned pro. That's what's, that's what's crazy. When when did you turn pro, Kev? 2020. 2020, right. Okay, so just for people who don't know much about the whole bodybuilding scene, right, what's the difference for someone just, just bodybuilding as yep. a hobby? Uh, or even just going to the gym because bodybuilding, like I would, I've been training for eight years, yep. but I would never say I was a bodybuilder. Yep. I don't yep. look like one. Yep. I'm in shit nick compared to all year lads, and and it would be that would be my biggest fear yep. to take me kit off and stand on stage. Right? Maybe that's why it would be a good thing to do it. Yeah. Sometimes because yep. because I, yep. I think ads you need a challenge, and yep. I think like that a lot. If you don't know by now, I run a business called The Content PT. I create content for influencers, PTs, online coaches, and fitness brands all around the world. So if you are someone who's in need for sexy content for your social media, or you really want to maintain a competitive edge in your industry, drop me a DM on Instagram. So so for anyone listening or watching who doesn't know the difference between a professional bodybuilder to yep. a hobbyist, someone who just goes to the gym, yep. what is the actual difference? Like with pressure, is the money, do you have to stay at a level of leanness all year What's yeah the there, there definitely becomes a level of pressure now when i turned pro i was really grateful for this to happen but i came out of the junior division straight into the professional leagues now it's a really cool thing to be able to have done but i came out of the amateur division at 22 immediately entering a league where your pros nowadays in the natural bodybuilding world are 35 and above mm. especially in the the dfac league that i compete in um your best of the best have been doing it for double the amount of time i've been doing it for i obviously lack in maturity muscle maturity against these boys um my training career is half compared to them competitive career is half compared to them so it was a massive achievement, but then I have to really take on board that I'm going to have a good few years to be able to really be super competitive against these boys. Now, I don't lack in size or anything like that. I have competed against them. We've already made a pro debut and I competed against them and never looked out of place, which was always my biggest fear, especially stepping on a stage and looking out of place. Unbelievable that. But... We held our own against the best of the best, which was all that mattered. And all that I lacked on again was muscle maturity. And that is something that... Which was a given, really. We, yeah. Really. You can't force that. Yeah. You, you can't take something to become more mature. You can only allow for time of training, dieting, getting bigger to, to bring that. Yeah. I suppose the advantage, though, with that, Kif, is you can be... Not that you want to, but you can be in and out the game. Yeah, you know, in your mid thirties, yeah. you could be yeah. done with bodybuilding. Yeah, and yeah. and because you are an online coach, and because yeah. you get people in the best shape of their yeah. lives, 
you know, especially when you put them through preps, going for shows themselves and all yeah. that type of stuff, you can look at it from a different angle as well. Yeah. So as much as, yeah, you're lacking muscle maturity, which can only come with time, yeah. at the same time, you can probably sap, squeeze the lemon quicker than the rest of the guys who are on stage. Is that your, is that your goal? Yeah, definitely. I, I would never put a time frame on it. Like, I love bodybuilding, and I would never say that I'm going to stop here. I'm going to do everything I can to get everything done now and stop here. But I would like to have achieved the majority if not everything within natural bodybuilding by the time i'm 30 yeah of course of course I get um that. and then you just have to kind of take on board like natural bodybuilding doesn't bring a lot of money mm. bodybuilding in general nowadays they are starting to push it a lot more especially on this um the on the assisted side mm-hmm. they're starting to um increase the prize money which i think is really 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 good because it's definitely something that they've not done for ages and for such an extreme sport i think that it should very much be up there with some sports that are giving out millions um so within natural bodybuilding there's not that much money um but at the same time the biggest part that i often see from the very best of the best within natural bodybuilding is just all out passion mm-hmm. because we have to diet longer. We have to do a lot of things that's different in a prep compared to somebody who has assisted. And I think a big part of that definitely comes down to the additional bit of time. Um, we've got nothing else to hold on to our muscle when we're dieting. So we unfortunately need to maybe diet for 10, 12 weeks longer than yeah, an assisted athlete. Um, and it definitely comes down to, again, prize money not being everything, but that passion to compete um and like i say the pressure from that as well especially in the pro leagues now i want to become an overall pro world champion so i do Mm -hmm. so in order to do that i am going to have to ensure that my off season's on point i am going to have to ensure that maybe i don't get too fat in the off season Mm -hmm. just to ensure that i'm always setting myself up for being able to track things better um and then of course when it comes to prep preps a different kettle of fish like I'm able to just make that transition from off season into prep, flick that switch and know that I'm in prep now. So there's no off plan meals, no meals get missed, no cardio gets missed, no steps get missed, no sleep get missed. Um, we have to just make sure that everything is as sweet as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you can't miss a beat in that game, can you? That's a thing. Nah. Especially, especially if you want the returns that you're looking for. Yep. Do you know yep. what I mean? I think, I think that's the thing as well, mate. It's, it's about having... If you know where you want to be, I mean, you can. I was speaking to another bodybuilder um, who who we both know, and he said to us, "He goes with bodybuilding, you can actually predict how you're gonna look. Yeah, yeah. If you had this off season and yeah. you're focusing on bringing that up, you will bring that up. Yeah. Like it's not like a oh, I didn't bring it up. If you want uh-huh, to bring it up, uh-huh. you can bring it up. Yeah, uh, whatever, whatever body parts are lacking, etc. But with you, do you have a? I mean, for instance, what's your what's your heaviest what's your heaviest pull? Off the floor mm-hmm. three. Uh, I'm going to say a 327 double. 327 yep, double. So 327. Off of a 10 kilogram bumper, 340 kilograms. Mate, yeah, that's fucking impressive. <laughs> now, I'm going to have to ask you the question with PEDs and stuff, mate, because I feel like I just have. I know you, yep. and I've worked with yep. you. Yep. I've I've created YouTube videos and all sorts with you, and I know what I need to know about you. I know you're a natural athlete. Yep. Um, I've seen you judging, I know you've been through it all. Um, but I know for a fact people are going to look at you and go, and there's no way he's natty because you're a monster, mate, for your size, for your age as well. And I mean, not even your age, just just being in your presence, you're a big lad. And what do you say to those type of people who, who think that? Because do you think it, I mean, clearly it is, but do you think it's attainable for anybody if they just put the work in? Or do you think it's, you are, it is down to your genetics? I, I think it's attainable for anybody. Do you? Um, I never started off in shape. I never started off anywhere near these sort of strength levels. Like I say, back at the very beginning, like I, I've isolated myself since I was 16 years old. Mm-hmm. Put everything in. When I started to gain more experience, admittedly, I never, I didn't start bodybuilding until I was a good few years into training. So again, I was learning more by that time. But ever since I've been 16, that's 10 years. And I've done this in 10 years, but I've not done this in 10 years of on off on off on off and especially when i started bodybuilding in 2017 i done my prep yeah i then moved into off season competed again moved into off season competed again i competed for the first 
four years of my bodybuilding career, like back to back. I think it was four four years, maybe even five years up till 2020. Four years, I think. Mm -hmm. But from then, it's been a case of I've got better at each and every single phase. I've got better at prep, better at off-season. In that process, I've got better at recovering, better at eating. I've got better at training. I've got better at learning how to do this better. Do yeah, you know what I mean? It's a continuous just line of, of progression. Mm -hmm. And it, it's always going to come back to that self development part, mm -hmm. and that's that's in absolutely everything. But genetics can they play a part? Yeah, absolutely. But you need to be willing to put time into what we do, and that's not just time into going to the gym for an hour a day. That's time into yeah, you need to go to the gym and you need to do what you need to do at the gym. But you also have to then come home and you also have to eat all your meals. You also have to get a specific amount of sleep. You also have to take a specific amount of supplements that yeah, you need to take. Yeah, of course. Because, and the reason I ask you this is not even from a, obviously for the, for the whoever wants to listen or watch this, yeah. me, me yeah. ask that question, but I also want to know for myself because, mate, I've trained, legit, mate, I've yeah. trained for about yeah. eight years. Yeah. And I've trained, I would say, at least four times a week or yeah. three times a week, yeah. minimum. And I've never, probably never ever had more than two weeks off yeah. or a week off, ever. How the hell do I look horrendous? Yeah, you've got lads who go out in the gym after a year and looking unbelievable is it literally be, just give it to us straight mate is it literally you're not training hard enough or your diet's gotta yeah, be yeah i mean it's because it's, it, it's, it's a science isn't it it's definitely probably going to come down to the fact of maybe not eating enough mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not training hard enough consistent enough mm -hmm. it's all good to be able to train hard two or three times a week yeah but then it's doing that every single week every single year that's that's what it's always going to come down to. It's always, it's all it's one of them games where you might find that you're maybe training hard, you might be eating enough, mm -hmm. might not be recovering enough. Yeah, so you 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 need to get There's, a percentage from everywhere, don't you? Really, hundred percent. It's like 100%. it's like a puzzle, isn't it? You've got to try and like hundred percent. So so, have you ever been curious about jumping on? A hundred percent. Hundred percent. Um, because for someone who can do what you can do naturally, yeah. it's got to be on your mind thinking, what could I do if I was assisted? Yeah, yeah. And especially being surrounded by quite a few boys who are assisted, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see or to even think what it would be like. And Have you ever been close? Relatively close. Like as in research, speaking to the right guys. Yeah, I've definitely done my research on it and I've definitely been surrounded. And Well, in fact, I've definitely got people in my circle who do take stuff, mm -hmm. who I am close enough with to be able to ask things um, and quiz them and learn that little bit more. And especially nowadays, like now there's so much more research being done. There's so much more knowledge out there. There's so much more learning out there. To that it's There's that much learning out there now that you could take stuff and be as safe as possible with it. So what stops you? Just that part of, there's something really drilled in me that I want to showcase to people for as long as possible what can actually be done without it. Because we are in a, we are in a generation now where even at Ultraflex, a higher percentage of people who take stuff are under 21. Yeah, it's terrifying. I know, man. Like I'm, I'm hearing about a few, a few coaches dishing it out and everything now, and I'm just like, I mean, I always kind of knew it went on, but now I'm just like, really, the lad's seventeen, man, and he's jumping on gear and he's doing X, Y, and Z, and I'm like, it's, it's blowing my mind, mate. It's scary because I'm like, I mean, there's there's two there's two sides for it, mate. So I actually spoke to someone today, yep. one yep. of my clients today, yeah, yep. um, and he takes stuff. He's not open about it. That's yep. why I'm not going to mention him, but he takes stuff. And part of me thinks, because a lot of people will say, well, yeah, but if you're going to compete or you're, you're a business, you know, you've got a business, you're a coach yeah. and your body's your business card, you want to get more clients, you want to get them spikes on Instagram, it's always good to jump on something and, and look bigger and, and all that, which I get. But I also think, if you, what happens if you just want to take something because you want to fill out a fucking t-shirt? Yeah, like, yeah. is there anything wrong with that? Like, it's your body. Like, you can buy alcohol, yeah, you can smoke yeah, cigarettes, yeah. you can vape, you yeah. can take all this other poison. Yeah. Is there something so wrong about wanting to do it just for the look of it? Or do you think, no, if you're ever going to do it, it's got to be to help you compete? Well, you have to take into consideration, and what a lot of people don't take into consideration is the part of the second that you put a first job in, your life's changed. Mm. Your life's changed. And especially if you're not doing it 
with knowledge behind you. You're not doing it with a coach behind you who's got that knowledge. You're not doing it off the back of going to keep it consistent. You're just doing it off of the back of, right, I want to fill out a t-shirt and I want to look good for 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. Then circumstances come into play and you stop taking it or you start taking something else or you have to stop taking it or problems occur in your body. Mm -hmm. Your hormones are completely gone. Mm -hmm. There's this, that much cons that can come along with just just taking this and just taking that for no other reason apart from just wanting to maybe fill out a t-shirt or just wanting to try and like i i personally think if you're taking stuff to try and attract more clients to you if you're wanting to be a coach or you're wanting to do a if you're wanting to make an app or something like that and you're just wanting to look good for content mm -hmm. you're wanting to do it. i think if you're doing that then you're absolutely in the wrong sport yeah, or you're and you're in I the agree. wrong industry I I agree. you're in the wrong industry um from my personal opinion i would say the only time you should ever entertain something so extreme is if you're wanting to take bodybuilding as far as possible Mm -hmm. If you're wanting to become IFBB pro, because you can't and compete and, and compete as a, a compete as a professional at the highest of levels, because then I would say right, you can't do it without it. You know what, mate? I I want to say it. I think it's quite refreshing that you've said that because you are a coach, you are a successful coach, and you are definitely urging people to not do that. And I think that's brilliant because I think bullshit baffles brains. I just swore there, so that will get baked out. But I think I think it does baffle brains, and instantly, you know, if I was a young lad. When, back when I was 18, if I someone, saw someone like you, whether you took it or not, and I wanted to get bigger, I'd be like, right, even if you didn't know, I'd be like, Kiff, what do I do? If you yeah, told us, yeah. I would just take it because I would like, look how he looks. Yeah, and that's yeah, the yeah. thing. That's the thing that gets people in it. Like, well, look how he looks. And I think that's what can be wrong because it's not regulated. Yeah, Anyone can yeah. dish it out. Yeah. So that leads us to me next bit, mate, because you are an online coach. And yeah. that, that's a big area that's not regulated as well. Yeah. Um, Obviously, I work with a lot of online coaches and create content for them, mate. Yeah. And I'm kind of on the fence with the whole regulation because I feel like if you can get results results for someone safely and you've did it, yep. coach away. Yep. I yep. mean, I, yep. I give people advice on how to create better content, yep. but yep. I'm not yep. qualified. Yep. Yep. So I do understand that totally. What's your thoughts on the state of online coaching? Because again, for people who are watching or listening and don't know who you are, um, I'm going to say it. Uh, you drive a flash car. You have a you have a you have a good lifestyle. You're smashing it with your clients. You're doing very well. You've relocated from from Scotland to Durham, um, and you seem certainly on social to have your your stuff together. So, what do you think of the state of online coaching, and and where do you think the future is for it? I'm hoping that it's on a kind of one eighty, that it's going to go back to what it was. Mm -hmm. 95% chance of that happening, probably not. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just got to that point now where it's kind of like what personal training went through as well. Like everybody became a PT because they just kind of thought it was easy money. Yeah. A lot of people are just seeing the money. A lot of people don't care about clients' progress, mm -hmm. clients' results. And I actually seen something about it today and, and now it's kind of, almost became about content it's it's became about how much free advice you can give online online coaching used to just be about results mm -hmm. about helping people about getting results like I, I know people with next to no experience inside and outside of bodybuilding who haven't got their hands dirty in training Mm -hmm. who are charging hundreds yeah, every yeah. single month. And then I know people with two times, three times experience that I've got who have been extremely um, competitive and really good at bodybuilding. Obviously, that doesn't really mean that much becoming an online coach, but at the same time, it's from experience. Yeah. Um, who know their stuff, who are who are charging next to nothing. Yeah. And I think that's the kind of unfortunate way that the industry is going. But what you are tending to see is 
you are noticing very quickly the people who are getting into it because they just think it's easy money. Yeah. And trust me, I'll and be the first one to say that it is not easy money. And do you think that they'll get whittled out eventually? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. You're seeing them all Cream fall away. You're it, seeing yeah. them fall away, which is more than to be expected. But it's just the unfortunate part is the rule of social media. Like social media is, is, is absolutely everything. And as long as you've got a presence on social media, that's all you need. So how hard is it to be an online coach? Well, it depends how good of a coach you want to be. So, so let's just say, because you're going to get a lot of young lads who are looking up to you. Um, I know a lot of online coaches, so yep. I'm kind of being playing devil's advocate here. Yep. But if you are a newly qualified PT, for instance, yep. and you've never did an hour on a gym floor, yep. Yep. you want to become an online coach, you've yep. seen people drive the flash cars yep. and the yep. trips to Dubai yep. and all yep. that type of stuff. Can they quickly make 10 grand a month? No, absolutely no. not. Unless they hire a business mentor in which will tell you how to hire 10 grand a month. But what they won't tell you at the start is they're going to take 40% of your wage at the end of the month. So mm -hmm. you make nothing. True. Yeah. The last place that I would say to go down. If you become a PT, get your hands dirty on the gym floor first. Learn how, learn people. Learn, learn how to, like, as a personal trainer, it can be tiring and it can be draining because you have to deal with people's emotions as well as people's physicality. So you have to deal with how people are going to respond to you telling them to go and do a deadlift. But you also have to deal with the problems that they've been having yeah. outside like of the gym. Aren't you? Yep. But yeah. see on see when you become an online coach, that, that triples, yeah. quadruples, 10 times. Mm -hmm. And especially when you're a good coach, what's also super important is attention. So some clients are going to need and require more attention than others. Some clients, you're going to give them their response back and they're not even going to reply to you until the next week until they check in again. Yeah. Some clients, you're going to be talking to every single day. Because there is there is a myth, or not a myth, but there's certainly a, a kind of, there's something that hangs around online coaches, which you hear a lot, and it's like, they only work three or four hours a day. Yep. And they're making twenty grand a month. Yep. How far of that how far how much of that is true? Can you can you do that? Can you build up a client base where you don't have to work a lot and have a very lucrative business? If you have other coaches under you that can help out with updates, mm -hmm. help out with replies, like it's not just uh respond to a check in. And then don't speak to that person until the next time. Like I say, people are going to need a little bit more attention than others. Yeah, that's it, isn't it? And I know that I'm for one who cares about other people's progress. So if somebody's struggling with something or somebody's got something that they need more attention with, I'm more than happy to be able to give them more attention. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that I work for 24 hours a day. But I'm also not going to sit here and say that I only work for two hours and that's literally it and nobody gets replies, nobody gets responses. I don't have anybody underneath me. Mm -hmm. I also do a lot of my own editing. I also mm -hmm. do loads of other things that's going to take up my day. And again, I have my own training. So it's, it's not just a case of... A lot of people see on social media now, on, on Insta now, that it's just... You can make 10k a month from online coaching. It's as easy as that. Mm -hmm. But... Nobody ever really wants to learn the the hard part of it all. Mm -hmm. The going through learning people. The going through working with people that's not even going to communicate with you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I think? Well, I think you've also got... the. I think a big part is, like even a bit like what I do, mate. Like I see lads picking up cameras thinking they can make a killing yeah. because they've saw people like myself or they've saw other people do it in the industry. And I think... I mean, I'm not saying I'm making a killing. I'm just saying I've... I've create a successful business yeah. and I feel like a lot of people will look at me and pick up a camera and I know a lot of lads who will message me all the time and, and ask for you know I've just bought a camera mate what type of lens shall I buy I'm like yeah. mate it ain't about the lens the lens isn't going to mm -hmm. build you the business it's about the network but are you willing to take a one way flight and do all this and do all the yeah. shit I've did I did the free shoots for 40 mate I've, I've filmed for 14 years do you know what I mean? this is not something I've did over the last couple of years yeah, so yeah. and I feel like are you willing to put that in and really get your, get in the trenches get your hands dirty yeah. and do it for fucking free as well um and I, and I feel like a lot of people see that. However, what I would say is, and this is, again, why I want to I wanna ask you this question, I also want to encourage people to pick up cameras and do creative things like yeah. that as well because you can make a lot of money. Yeah. I know yeah. that, mate. Yeah. I genuinely know guys doing 30 grand a month with yeah. it and they yeah. work for themselves. 
as yep. a content creator, and I know them like they're my friends. Mm. So, I mean, mate, I know lads who, you know what I mean, like the average wage in the northeast thinks about twenty five grand a year. Yeah, yeah. So to do that in a month by owning a camera for three grand, like it can be done. Mm-hmm. With the online coaching thing, who is who is it for? Who would you recommend if you're this type of person? Maybe online coaching should be the, the way to go. You need to want to help people because you're going to go through a solid amount of time making nothing before you make something. And at the end of the day, we need to be real. It is a business. It is, it's my job. Mm-hmm. It is your job. But if money making is the only thing that you see, then you're the last person for such an industry. And I'll be the first to say it, you're going to be the worst coach. Love that, like. Mm -hmm. It's like you creating content. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a business. Yeah, you need to make money. Yeah, you need to put food on the table. But do you love creating content? Absolutely, man. I get, get excited. I get excited to go to bed on a night, man, to work the next day. I don't wake up in the morning and do 15, 20, 25 check-ins and think, like, oh, this is endless. This is boring. This is this. Like, just yeah. do this. Just do that. Like, I'm getting up every single day and I'm, like, I'm ready to be able to Where you're help at, what more. results yeah, we got, what can yeah. we do next? Like, I'm, I'm pestering people if they're not giving me enough information. Yeah. I'm, like, do you know, it's, it's things like that. that yeah. I'm having people come to me and like one of the first questions that I'm asking them is what do you really want to achieve? Because that's then going to dictate how much effort they need as well. What do you normally find So when someone gets signs up with it, you? It totally depends. Like I often get a lot of people coming to me because of my mindset mm-hmm. or because of my approach to training. People, A lot of people I find are intrigued on how I can keep all your big powerlifting movements in squats um barbell presses deadlifts heavy and still look like a bodybuilder still do bodybuilding training with that i get a lot of people interested in things like that but at the same time i then get people who have seen me compete who have seen what i've been able to achieve who want to compete or who have competed before i even work with professionals already so people who have competed even for longer than me who are professionals who want to take that professional status to that next level and become so much better again and then at the same time, I'm getting people who are just wanting to maybe drop a bit of body fat. But what type of things do you see that predominantly men? Do you only coach men? What do you coach? Both, both, both male and female. What, yep. Okay, well, I'll speak for the lads yep. first. What do most lads want to be coached by you for? Is it a confidence thing? Is it a competitive thing? Is it I'm young and I just want to be as strong as you? Like, what is it? Do yep. you know what I mean? Everybody, everybody wants to get strong in the gym but look good. That's that's always one thing that you'll always see. Um, now, but, mate, let me just jump in with this, right? And I'm not saying I'm not saying this yep, for any reason. Yep. I have never been asked about being strong. Never. Ne- it's never even went through me yet. I couldn't give a rat's jackie. Do that's, you know that's, that's that's a good thing though. That's a good g- thing. Genuinely, mate, and I mean that. That's like, a good thing. I, I wouldn't say I was weak, but I'm, I'm I've never been like let's. I've, I'm not like that. With str- yep. it's weird. I don't know. Yep. Like yep. if someone said to me, "Ads, you can look like Kiff." By lifting ten pound dumbbells. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sam <laughs> will Like I'm good with that. I'm not. I'm not bothered if I'm curling six. Like it's, you know, it's not my. Yep, yep. So I feel like for young lads that want to be obviously it's a good thing because you know I mean the more strength you've got the better. But I ultimately think what I'm trying to get at Kiff is it an aesthetic thing the chasing or is it a mental thing? Everybody wants to look good. Mm-hmm. Uh you'll get the tiniest margin of of people who'll come to you and say. They're not bothered about how you how they look. They just want to get strong, grow as much as possible, have a, a really big off-season phase. They're not bothered about staying in shape. You'll get the tiniest amount of people that will come to you and say that. Mm-hmm. But you will find that a lot of people will come because they lack in structure. They lack in routine. They need help with somebody to be accountable to, to be able to eat what they need to eat, yeah, recover what they need to recover like, and train the way that they need to train. Mm-hmm. And not everybody wants to become a bodybuilder. People maybe just want the lifestyle of a bodybuilder, which is another main part. Like, you can be a bodybuilder without getting on stage. A lot of people just love the lifestyle. 
pro- it's probably a nicer lifestyle yeah. to a degree because you can still eat a bit of crap. Yeah, yeah, and look half decent. Hundred percent. Do you know what I mean? So there's there's got to be that balance to, to, as well. The the last thing I want to ask you, Kif, because I feel like I, could t- I mean I'm gonna need a part two here at some point, but <laughs> I feel like there's so many things that I want to talk about because mindset's a big one for me, and I want to yeah. I want really want to dial into mindset and diets. However, what I think will do the episode justice more and the viewers can comment if, if I've if I've took the wrong path. You're on YouTube as yeah. well. Um, yeah. you know, you've you've hit ten point five K yeah. subscribers yeah. and I know it's I I think it's something like it's just as hard to hit ten K on YouTube to hundred K on Insta. I yeah. think that's yeah. the comparison I keep hearing. Um now obviously it's took you a while to get there. Do you think it's important for people in the fitness industry, whether you are a coach or just someone who competes or just someone who goes to the gym, to put out social media content, gym-based? Yeah, absolutely. It is definitely important, but I think what's also important is to be able to be real about it as well Hmm. because we are in an industry now which a lot of people are just doing what they're seeing other people do, who they maybe think is a successful coach but might not actually be a successful coach. And I think because of that as well, yes, people want advice and if people can get free advice even better but at the same time what I've definitely learned and what I've got a lot of feedback from is about how real I've been so I might not agree with what Joe Blogs on Instagram says but I'm more than happy to be open about that I'm more than happy to give out advice that I believe in give out advice that I've got research from myself Mm -hmm. whether that be from me from other people or from what I've seen that I know works but I think it's very important to put out social media content, yes, because you need to be relevant, especially in this day and age where social media is absolutely everything. Like, word to mouth now is still there for maybe a small percentage, but at the end of the day, social media is how a lot of people make their money. Yeah, that's it, like, isn't it? And, whether, and that's, that's whether you've got a business that is social media orienta- orientated or not. Yeah, because you need point. to market some way and unfortunately driving a van about with your details on the side doesn't do everything for you now that, like you're was seeing that, was that a dig you, you're, you're, <laughs> no you're you're seeing you're seeing i've seen so many people yeah, yeah. now plaster whether it's facebook instagram anything yeah because that's where it's at so i think social media presence content is really important but there's just a certain way to go about it in order to be able to make sure that you're not having people look at it and think, I've just seen three posts that's the exact same as that. Yeah, that's right. Like and You I, also want people to be real about it. And I suppose with what for the online coaches, the kind of way they're online. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. they're online. So the, yeah. like a lot of sponsorship, well, all sponsorship effectively yeah. is attracted by being online. And 100%. obviously you're with, are you still with Gasp? Yep, yep, yep. I'm assuming. Um, so obviously with Gasp, you fly around the world, you do all these wonderful things with those guys. And again, it's because of your social media. So if you are listening, I think it's really important to, to get that presence. And I yep. think I think that's important for anyone, me. Like you say, because you're right, it's not all about word of mouth now. No. And, I mean, I only know you through Instagram. Yep. I remember seeing you in the gym thinking... I know him, yeah, but I don't yeah. know him. I've never, I've never spoken to you before, and it's, it's purely through that. And it's, you're right, mate. It's, I think to, the key point from that is to stay, to stay relevant. It's um, exact same as YouTube. Something right. like YouTube's so hard to grow, mm-hmm. but if you don't stay relevant, as in you don't stay consistent with putting in time to edit videos and upload them, whether they get ten views or ten thousand views, it's not going to budge. You're not going to grow. Kiff for anybody out. Are you still taking people on? Yes. For anybody out there who might want to hire someone like yourself as a coach, um, we'll include some clips of you lifting <laughs> Great. Over, the, over this. But, uh, <laughs> but for anybody who wants to hire as a coach, I want to know who should be hiring you and where can they find you? Anybody who's willing to make a change. And I say that because a lot of people really want to make a change but aren't willing to commit. And hey, that's totally fine. But be able to admit that. If you're willing to make a change, then I will 100% take you there. Mm -hmm. But if you just think you are, then there's not really any point in wasting each other's time. And I'm always going to be honest with anybody. I'll be, I, I, I only give out what I expect back. Yeah. And as a bodybuilder, I don't, for anybody that's listening, I don't just take on bodybuilding clients or people who want to become bodybuilders, male or female. I don't care. Mm -hmm. If you're willing to commit to your goal, 
-hmm. whether you want to build muscle, lose body fat, maintain, build accountability, learn how to eat properly, it literally could be anything at all. That part of being able to give that commitment there and, and, and work towards that desired goal, let's do something, 100%. Where can they find you? Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, I'm all over it. It's always just Kiffy West, whether it be Insta, YouTube, Facebook, what else, what, TikTok, literally anything. But the main one will be Insta um, throughout either my coaching page or my personal page or my coaching application form, anything at all. Unbelievable. Oh, actually, Ask your name's not actually Kiffy West, is it? <coughs> yes. <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> it's actually Christopher McCready. And why is it Kiffy West? Because Kiffy West, when I became a professional wrestler, I had to ultimately choose a stage name. Mm -hmm. I very much looked up to John Cena. John Cena was from West Newbury, Massachusetts. Massachusetts? Mass yeah. Ma I'm not even going to... I'm not even going to say it again, yeah? yeah? Because he was from the West, that's where the West came from because I wanted something to do with John Cena because he was... The reason why. That role model, yeah. 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 And Kiffy's always been my nickname because when I was young, my cousin could, could never say Christopher. She could only say Kiffy. And she's going to love the fact that I've just said that on this podcast for everybody to know. Unbelievable. Um, but yeah, so Kiffy was my nickname growing up. Even throughout school, the teachers would call me that. It literally just stuck. It stuck. Unbelievable. To the point of where when people found out my name was Chris, Christopher, they were like, oh my God. So because of that, I... I um, had that as my social media platform names. And when I kind of put the wrestling to the side as well, I was like, do you know something? I'm just going to keep it. And I think it fits. I think it suits. Unbelievable, mate. Right, so I hope you all enjoyed me sitting down with the strongest man and biggest man in Ultraflex by, what What did we say, five? I think we said five miles, yeah. Five miles. Me sitting here for this hour, it's probably went up to about six and a half miles. So. Six and a half. So there's me, then Kiff, and then everyone else. Right, let you, let you, <laughs> right, cheese for your time, Kiff. What can oh, legend? Oh, man. Cheese, mate. Thank you for that, mate. Appreciate it.